again, everybody, for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It is an honor to be back here in West Laco. I was here a few years ago. I know Father Mike Gately, Father Don Calloway, and others have been here. So this is an honor for me to be back. Now, what are we talking about today? We are talking about the Catholic Mass. And in the Catholic Mass, we have everything. Everything. People say, well, Father, I don't go to Mass because I don't get anything out of it. You can't get anything more out of the Mass. People say, well, Father, and I have friends and family, one of my, my own relatives go into these non-denominational churches because the pastor rides unicycle and juggles. <laughs> the Mass is not about your entertainment. The Mass is about worship. And what's important about worship is it's actually a virtue. To get to heaven, we need to grow in virtue. Religion falls under the virtue of justice. Why? Because justice is not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Justice is giving someone their due. And what God is due is our worship. And so when we go to Mass, we're giving God His due. He's due worship. We come to Mass to give it. And this is why religion falls under the virtue of justice. And this is important. And people will, oh, Father, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Y'all heard that, right? Well, remember, say to them in return, really? You're not into organized religion? No. No, I'm not. That's too bad. Because Jesus organized religion. Jesus organized religion. He established the College of Bishops. He ordained the first bishops and the apostles. Gave them the authority to forgive sin and to ordain the next priest. There's apostol installed apostolic succession. He established the throne of the papacy and put Peter upon that throne. Gave us the magisterium. Established the church. Gave us the sacraments. And yet you're not into organized religion. Jesus was into organized religion. This mass from start to finish, is biblical. Do you know there is more scripture in one Catholic weekday Mass than any Sunday Protestant service, period? More. And this is what we're going to talk about today. All right. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. The words of Jesus we have a lot more. We have over 700 registered today. We have a lot more people than two or three. And we are gathered in his name. So, the Mass is an encounter between God and man, but not just in prayer. Word, gestures, symbols, they are all used to result in grace. Why? Because we are not just spirits. You go to these other worship services, they don't engage the body. Oh, you Catholics, you're just about stand, sit, kneel. There's a purpose for that. Because we're not just spirit. We are body and spirit. We are a composite. This is important. We engage not just our spirit in prayer, but our body. Now let's talk about stand, sit, kneel. First of all, why do we stand? We stand because standing in the Mass is a sign of respect. This is very important. Why do we kneel? We kneel in humility. Make ourselves small. God is big. So we kneel. What about sit? We sit in receptive position. Why are you all sitting right now? Because you're receiving this message. So there's a reason we do this. All right. What about genuflection, you crazy Catholics? You know, I'm so used to genuflecting. I was in the Mormon Tabernacle uh, Choir the other day 
because I was doing a talk in Salt Lake City, and I went in and I automatically genuflected. I'm like, no, you're not supposed to do that. Now, why do we genuflect? Because genuflection is a sign of adoration. Now, when do you genuflect? Can anybody tell me when you genuflect? All right. When you cross in front of the Blessed Sacrament, right? Now, what if you're walking before the altar? Do you genuflect? No! You do a bow in reverence. When you walk in front of a crucifix, do you genuflect? If it's Good Friday. You genuflect before the crucifix on Good Friday. So you see we have a reason here. Otherwise, the same thing we do a bow to show reverence in honor. What about the names of Jesus and Mary? If you see a priest and he's reading from the scriptures, a good priest does what? At the name of Jesus or Mary, he does a slight head bow. This is why it's so important not to use their names in vain. The name of God is so holy that the, the Israelites, the, the Jews didn't even say it, let alone irreverently. All right. What about singing? Is singing something? Oh, I don't like singing, Father. I'm no good at it. Well, okay. Singing unites your personal prayer with the communal prayer. It's very important. Do you know Jesus saying on his way to the Passion? Jesus did. That'd be pretty hard, wouldn't it? Think amazing how our Lord was to sing on his way to his Passion. What about... Um, the rest of the Mass, you are coming to participate. Singing's a good way to do this. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be in tune. <laughs> All right? If God didn't give you a good voice, give it back to him. <laughs> I do that all the time. I do it all the time. But when we sing, we unite with the heavenly choir. This is important. Now, what about the flip side? Silence. What about silence? Silence can mean more than words. Silence is very important. It gets us prepared, right? But words are powerful. So is silence. In fact, what are the most important words St. Joseph ever spoke in Scripture? Nothing. <laughs> Father Don Calloway has that book out right now, Consecration of St. Joseph. We can't keep it in stock. Because St. Joseph is such a powerful tool, especially against the evil one. But he never spoke a word. Maybe not ever, but in Scripture. In Scripture. A lot of ladies are saying, now that's the ultimate husband. <laughs> all right. All right. So the Mass is all of this. This is the Mass. Now, the very nature of the Mass is sacrificial. But here's what's important. Not until the 1500s did the Protestants begin to reject the idea of a sacrificial mass and they replaced it with ceremonies focused just on prayer and song. When you lose the sacrificial meaning of the mass, you've lost something important. Now, I want to address this thing going on in the church between modernists and traditionalists. Do you know what I mean? The modernists, post-Vatican II, oh, don't give me that Latin mass stuff. And then you got the traditionalists, pre-Vatican II, that are all about saying the new mass is invalid. You're both wrong, but you both have a point. I was just given a missile before I came up here. I was going to start to do this talk, but it was the 1962 missile. I can't do my talk that I want to do from the 62 missile, but does that mean it's not a good missile? No. It's very important that we realize there are two forms of the Mass. The extraordinary form and the ordinary form. The extraordinary form or the Trinitine Mass or, or the Latin Mass is just as valid. We are allowed to celebrate it. But those who are, are focused on the Novus Ordo Mass should not criticize the traditional form and vice versa. The traditionalists should not criticize the new form of the Mass, the Novus Ordo, 
Both are valid, filled with infinite grace. Now, here's what's important to remember. Traditionalists, God bless you, but I've met a lot of you, and you've said to me, Father, people in the 1500s would not recognize the Mass today. Ugh. Is that true? Would people in the 1500s not recognize our Mass today? Yes, it's very true because it's very different. But here's what they fail to see. While the people in the 1500s might not recognize our Mass today, the people in the 700s would. This Mass that we celebrate today is actually even, in a way, more ancient than the Trinitine Extraordinary Form Mass. We went back to the ancient sacramentary, some of the prayers that are pulled out, People from the 700s would recognize what we do today because it's going back to the Mass being a sacrifice and a meal. You see, the problem is the Trinity Mass was not the first form of the Mass. People keep thinking that that was the first form of the Mass. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. The ordinary form is actually more traditional. But does that mean that the, the extraordinary form isn't good? Of course not. It's wonderful, and I think it is very reverent. I hope to learn to celebrate it someday. So we can't criticize either form. You see, the traditional form of the Mass is beautiful, but even before that, we had the Mass similar to the way that we have it today. The problem is, throughout history, we either swayed on one side or the other. Back when Christ set up the Mass, it was both a sacrifice and a meal. It was both. Now, as time went on, it became just a meal. Then the traditionalists got upset, and in the Trinitine form, they brought back just the sacrifice. But now we're trying to get back to it's also a meal. So we constantly have to realize that it's both. This is important. All right. Now, let's start with the Mass now. I'm going to walk you through this. When does the Mass begin? The procession, good, no. When does the Mass begin? Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, good, no. When does the Mass begin? The uh, uh, introductory rite, good, no. When we stand, good. If you're talking about at home, getting ready to come here. The Mass begins in your heart. Oh, <laughs> the Mass begins in your heart. You have to open your heart to receive this grace given by God. This is what people don't realize. I remember as a kid riding to, to church and my dad and mom would be arguing. Then I remember my dad's a tough Marine, Vietnam Marine, flew helicopters out of Da Nang. And I remember one time getting to Mass, he gets in a fight with a guy in the parking lot. It's like, come on, we're missing the point here. All right, now once we get to Mass, we begin with the very first part of the Mass. The very first part of the Mass is called the introductory rite. This is the first part of the Mass. Now in it, we do either an opening song or an entrance antiphon, right? Now, singing, as I said, brings us unity as community with one voice. Now... I remember when I was in the seminary, Father Larry, God bless his soul, said to me after one day I led the singing, he said, you know, Brother Chris, you really shouldn't sing. <laughs> and I said, Father Larry, Augustine says to sing is to pray twice. And Father Larry says, Brother Chris, St. Augustine said, to sing well is to pray <laughs> twice. And so, I said, okay, Father Larry, but I go back to that. If God didn't give you a good voice, give it back to him. We should still try our best to sing. Okay, so with the song, the priests and the, and the other members of the Mass, the clergy or, or anybody who's involved in the Mass, the lector sometimes, come forward. The priest comes up forward, and he does what is the first thing the priest does up here? 
venerates the altar. Why do we do that? The table, excuse me, this altar is both a table and a cross. Meaning, it's a table for a meal by which we will gather around as a family. And it is an altar that is a cross for sacrifice. So this altar is both a table for a meal and a cross for a sacrifice. Both are in this mass. Now, what's the first thing the priest does? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This comes after the opening song or the entrance antiphon. Now, we as Catholics are always criticized. Oh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I see people come in the church all the time. Oh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I begin the Mass. Oh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do you realize what you're doing? We sign ourselves because we're body and spirit. And when we do this, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, we name God as the reason we are here. We are naming him as the reason we are here. Now, we also do something in this gesture. Do we have any cowboys here? We're in Texas. Do we have any cowboys? What do cowboys do with their cattle? They brand them. Why do they brand them? So that they have a mark. I belong to this rancher. When you do this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we are marking ourselves like branding to show that we belong to God. We are marking our soul. We belong to God. This is to show who we belong to. Holy water. Do you not put your finger in the holy water before you do it? You do that because it reminds us of our baptism. We become one with Christ for this celebration. So we baptize ourselves in a way or holy water like baptism. Now, after I say the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what do you say? Amen. Amen. What does that mean? I believe. So you are saying, I believe. The priest leads in prayer, but he's not praying without you. You are praying with him. The amen makes it your prayer too. Now what happens next is the greeting. The priest hands up in the traditional Jewish form of prayer, says the Lord be with you. And that means that we're establishing that God is present. He is here. So I say the Lord be with you. I'm saying the Lord is here. He's in your presence. And what do you say? And with your spirit. Just something the church made up, right? No, scriptural. This is from 2 Timothy 4.22. The Lord be with your spirit. Everything in this Mass is scriptural. Everything. Yes, he is here, and I acknowledge it, God is here. You don't know all this is going on. All right, we say the same thing, the Lord be with you, and with your spirit in all the parts of the Mass. And we'll get to them as we go along. All the parts of the Mass, this is repeated. That's how important it is. Now, after this, the priest moves on to what part of the Mass? Penitential rite. Very important. Why? Okay. When you go to confession, do you have to confess every single sin you can remember? No. <laughs> Why? Let me finish. There's a couple reasons. First of all, if you really did do that, you'd be in the confessional all day long. <laughs> Secondly, the church teaches we are required to confess all grave sins that we can remember. All grave sins that we can remember. Does that mean you shouldn't confess the little venial sins? No. It's a good habit. But should you kill yourself if you are saying, I, gosh, I forgot one. Call me at 2 o'clock in the morning to wake me up. <laughs> so that I can hear your confession because you forgot to confess you ate the last piece of pizza. Okay? No. 
The reason we don't, but it's a good habit if you want to, that's fine. I'm not discouraging it. But the reason is why. Where are your venial sins forgiven? In the Mass. In the penitential rite. So if you've been to confession for your grave sins, and then you come to Mass and you make it before the penitential rite, your sins are completely forgiven and you are spotless from head to toe. You are completely cleansed. This is why Martin Luther left the church. He was a Catholic priest. He didn't leave the church because people always say we sold indulgences. Martin Luther left the church because he couldn't belong to a religion that said if he didn't confess every single sin, he was going to hell because he wasn't forgiven. That's not what the church teaches. If you honestly forget a sin, you are forgiven. And even your venial sins, if you don't confess, are forgiven in the mass. Confession of grave sins is mandatory. All right. So, this is very important. Now, in the penitential rite, it's not to remind God of our sins, he already knows them, but for us to see our need for his mercy. Right? Now, in it, we have what? There are many examples of the penitential rite. The um, examples of the confidior, um, we have very many examples. But let's do the confidior. What is the confidior? If this is what the priest chooses to pray. The priest prays, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters. Or we could say, Lord, you have come to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. This is important. Now, in it, if the priest prays the confidior, after that he finishes, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Do you do this? No! You do not make the sign of the cross after the end of the confidior because that is a sign of absolution in the sacrament. You are receiving absolution not in the sacramental sense. So you don't make the sign of the cross at that point. You just simply say amen. Your venial sins are forgiven, but it's not sacramental absolution. So the penitential rite ends with an absolution of venial sin in a sense, but not sacramental. You still have to go to confession, especially for grave sins. Now, there is um, a couple other things. If I didn't do the confidior, but I did, you've come to heal, sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy, you say, Christ have mercy. Where does this come from? Again, scriptural. Lord have mercy. We say it all the time. Where does that come from? Tobit 8.4. Let us pray that the Lord may have mercy upon us. You say, Christ have mercy. Where does that come from? Jude 121. Wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ atan to eternal life. And then I say, Lord have mercy again. That could go back to any scripture passage, Matthew 20, 31. Lord have mercy on us, son of David. This is all scriptural. All right, now, if it's a Sunday Mass, what happens next? Come on, Catholics. Gloria! The Gloria! Why is this important? The angels sung this at the birth of Jesus. Not only that, it's scriptural. This song gives praise to the entire Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Gloria, which is a very important prayer, and I have it right here in the Missal, the glory, let's go through this for a minute. I, I, you know, I probably don't have time to do all of it. Let me just give you an example. How does it start? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Where does that come from? Oh, the Catholic Church just made it up. No. Luke 2.14. This is from the Bible. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. All right? Now, after the collect, if it's a Sunday Mass, or now, if it's a, if it's a Sunday Mass, we pray the collect, I'm sorry, the um, Gloria. What comes next? I just gave it away. The collect, or the opening prayer. Now, today's a Saturday, so if I'm going to the sixth Sunday of ordinary time, the collect, the priest raises his hand and says, O oh God, who teach us that you abide in the hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you, through Christ our Lord. And we say that whole prayer. This is important. 
because in the collect we have, we collect ourselves. We get ourselves ready for this Mass. And then, how does he open up before the collect? Let us pray. So it's specific, that collect is specific to the particular day of the liturgical year. All right, now, now we begin the first of the two major parts of the Mass. What are the two major parts of the Mass? Liturgy of the Word and Liturgy of the Eucharist. All right, let's try to do Liturgy of the Word, and then we'll take our break, and I'll finish Liturgy of the Eucharist at the second talk. All right, Liturgy of the Word consists of how many readings? I heard two. No. I heard three. No. Four. If it's a Sunday Mass, four readings from Scripture. What are they? The first is typically from the Old Testament. <clears throat> the second is a psalm. The psalms. The third is a reading normally from the epistles. What is an epistle? I asked my seventh grade catechism class what is an epistle, and the one boy said, a baby apostle. <laughs> no, an epistle is not a baby apostle. <laughs> epistle is one of the letters. All right? So the third reading is one of the, usually from one of the epistles, but it doesn't have to be. And finally, the fourth reading is what? The gospel. All right. Then, before we read the gospel, we have something called the gospel acclamation. This is where I try to sing the Alleluia. It's important because we acclaim God to the world. We sing the Alleluia and then we rise. Why do we rise? Again, because the Alleluia is a joyful word and we're standing to praise and honor God. All right. Now, we don't use it, though, in Lent. Why? Because it is a time of penance, not joy. Alleluia is a joyful hymn. Now, this sets the tone for the gospel and gives the theme for the gospel. Usually a little short reading, right? And this is important. But, as I said, we rise because we are now hearing the words of Jesus himself. Okay, this is important. When an important person comes in the room, we rise. It's a sign of respect. Remember the days when gentlemen would always stand up when a lady entered the room? We've lost that. I notice that now, and I'm guilty of it myself sometimes. It's, it's, it's not good. We should always do that. Jesus is even now more present because we are hearing his own words. He is now in the room. All right? Jesus, when we open the Mass, notice the progression here. When we began the Mass, I said, the Lord be with you. You said, with your spirit. And I said, in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're acknowledging that first, Christ is here present in spirit. That's what began the Mass. So we open up the Mass, Christ is with us in spirit. Now we get to the liturgy of the Word. Now Christ is with us as the Word. And soon, he's going to be with us in actual body and blood. Okay? So you can see as the Mass moves along what is happening. Why do we call Jesus the living word? Why is Jesus called the word? You ever watch EWTN? The Eternal Word Television Network? Right? Why do we call him the word? Because in the beginning it says, when God the Father spoke in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh all right i'm going to give you a whole year of seminary in one minute <laughs> the trinity the trinity not easy to understand but really not that hard if you want to know what the trinity is kind of honestly think of yourself for a minute when god the father thinks he speaks. When you think, you speak. Now don't be like me and speak before you think. <laughs> when God the Father thinks, 
He speaks. When the Father, think of yourself. God the Father speaks. What comes out is part of you. The Word. It's who you are. It's what is on your mind and in your heart. Comes out your words. So when God the Father speaks, what comes forth is the Word, the Son. Now, in order to have the Word, you can't have any Word without what? A breath. A breath is the Holy Spirit. So all of that is me. My thoughts become my words, and my words become possible with the power of my breath. God the Father is the origin. When he speaks, the word is the Son. It becomes manifest. This is what we have now in the Mass. We're ready to enter into the liturgy of the word. And Christ becomes present to us in the word. But the word doesn't happen without the power of the breath. That is the Holy Spirit. So this is very important. Now, in this Mass now as we proceed, who reads the Gospel? All right, the priest. What if there is a bishop, a priest, and who reads the Gospel first? The bishop. Now, what if there's a priest and a deacon? Who reads the, bishop, who reads the, uh, the Gospel first? The deacon. Now, what if there's two priests... And one is the main celebrant. Is he the one who reads the gospel? No, it's the con-celebrating priest. So, the celebrant or the deacon will read the gospel before the celebrant. All right? Now, if it's a deacon, he will come to the priest and receive his blessing. Why? Because what the priest says is, May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may proclaim his gospel worthily and well. You don't hear that. That's what the priest is saying as he's blessing the deacon. Now, if it's a priest, he goes straight. But do you notice that before he goes to the ambo, does he not bow at the altar? And what he is saying is, cleanse my heart and my lips, almighty God, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. You see, this is going on. Then he goes to the ambo, and he professes the gospel. But how does he start? The Lord be with you. Because now we're introducing the Lord in a newer way. He's now present in the Word. Before, when the priest said, Lord be with you, he was talking in spirit. Now the priest goes and forward. Why does he say it again? The Lord be with you. Because now the Lord is present in the Word. And you say, and with your spirit. And then he says, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. And what do you say? Glory to you, O Lord. So you are acknowledging this. Now... Do you make a, another sign of the cross? Where? Forehead, the lips, and the heart, right? The forehead, lips, and the heart. This is where God should be. In your mind, on your lips, and in your heart. We open our minds to hear God's word, and we plan to share it with others by speaking with our lips, and we declare we believe in Jesus with all our hearts. Very important. At the end of the reading of the gospel, you say, praise to, I say the word of the Lord, and you say, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then you will see the priest bow down and kiss the book. This is the missal, but if it was the, the lectionary. And when he does that, he says, through the words of the holy gospel, may our sins be wiped away. You don't think you're participating in this? Oh, I'm tired, looking at my watch. Do you realize what's going on? The priest or the deacon just basically asked through the words of the gospel, may our sins be wiped away. This is powerful stuff. This is grace going on that you don't even know about. Then, what comes next? A homily. On the reading, why do we do a homily? Oh, because it sounds good. It makes it break up things in the Mass. No, it's scriptural. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, preach the word. Be urgent, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and the exhort be unfailing in patience and in teaching. I like that, rebuke. Because, you know, we don't have enough priests today teaching the truth. 
You know, I go to the, I belong at the, or I, I live and work at the shrine of, the, the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And I tell the people there every day how grateful I am that I am there. Because I regularly preach on the five non-negotiables. Does anybody know what the five non-negotiables of our Catholic faith are? The five non-negotiables of our Catholic faith are things that you must hold to. There are no negotiations. They are abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and gay marriage. Now, I add to that contraception. So you will hear me all the time preach against these things. They're intrinsically evil, and there is no negotiation, period. That's a teaching of our faith. But yet there are so many priests who don't. And I know I'm going to get in trouble someday. I know that one day it's coming. It's coming from Canada. I tried to get into Canada the other, well, it wasn't that long ago, but it was a while ago. And they wanted to know why I was there. I said, I'm the keynote speaker in Ottawa. And they said, of what? And I said, well, I'm a Catholic priest. The, they called in the head of their version of Homeland Security, asked me what I was talking on. I said, well, I don't understand. He said, well, give us your notes. I said, well, you're going to have to come to the talk because I don't use notes. I do on this particular talk, but this wasn't the talk I was given. All of my other talks, I don't use notes. This is really getting scary. He said, well, we have laws in Canada, and it's my job to enforce them and that you don't break them. Really? Teaching the truth is breaking the law. And so we have to understand that it's coming to America. I have this feeling that you, one day you're all going to look, read the newspaper one day and you're going to see my picture. It's going to say, priest is put in prison. <laughs> so all I ask you is come visit me. <laughs> I love your culture. You guys love to eat. Bring me food, okay? <laughs> That's all I ask. Bring me food. Because, <laughs> because if, if I'm going to go to jail, at least feed me. I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever else I can, but I think the time is coming. All right, so let's get back to this. Why does a priest give a homily? He needs to teach the truth. But here's what we have to remember. The homily is only to be done by clergy, like deacons, priests, or bishops. It's not to be done by anybody else. Now, is a, is a homily mandatory? Does a priest have to give a homily? Yes, if it's Sunday. Yes, yeah, it's Sunday. Is there any time limit? No. One of our priests, Father Michael Clay, God bless him, but he forgot it was his turn and he had to do a homily and he gets up there. He had no homily prepared and he just looked at everybody and he goes, fire. <laughs> and he sat down. That was his homily. Some of you probably would like the homily like that. But in a weekday mass, the priest does not have to give a homily. It's a good idea, but he doesn't have to. But it's mandatory on Sundays. Now, what's the difference between a sermon and a homily? You hear our non-Catholic brothers say, oh, it was a great sermon. We Catholics give homilies. Protestants give sermons. What's the difference? All right. A homily refers to a specific reading and applies it to daily life. Like, I'll read about the Annunciation or about Mary's visitation. And I will preach on that particular gospel passage. A sermon is different. A sermon is a particular topic, and it will pull from multiple scriptures to be able to talk about that topic. Like maybe growing in virtue, then a sermon will be pulling multiple passages from scripture about that, whereas a homily is reading a particular passage and then talking about the passage. Not a huge difference, <clears throat> but that is what it is. Now, after the homily comes what? Silence. Silence. All right? So this is important. Now, if it's Sunday, what is the next thing that comes in the part of the Mass? The creed. Very good. Or the pers pers blah, profession of faith. This is a statement of the Apostles' faith. You just rattle through it, not even thinking of the words. Do you realize what you're saying? You are stating the faith of the apostles. This is what's in the creed. The creed leads us to an act of faith in the Holy Trinity and what each of those members of the Trinity does for us. Let's look at just a couple examples. I'm running out of time, and I don't have time to do it all. All right. 
The priests and the people say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You know, that comes from Genesis 14, 19. God most high, maker of heaven and earth. Then, of all things visible and invisible. Never heard that before? Well, open your Bible, Colossians 1, 16. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. That comes right from Luke 1, 35. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Begot, not made, consubstantial with the Father. What does that mean? Turn to John, verse, chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. That's what consubstantial means. Of one substance. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That comes from 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now notice Catholics with a small C, not a big C. Capital C means our Catholic faith. But that comes from the word Catholic, small C. What does that mean? Universal. <clears throat> this comes from Romans 12:5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. That's what that means. So this whole thing goes on and on. I can't explain the whole creed, but you get the point. This is powerful stuff. All right, the creed concludes with our belief in the resurrection from the dead and eternal life in heaven. This is the basis of our faith. We must pray this prayer because we can't know this on our own. It must be revealed to us. This is important. All right. Now, what comes after the creed? If it's a Sunday Mass? Petitions or intercessions or universal prayer or prayers of the faithful. Okay. Now, these intercessions are important. First of all, why do we do them? Again, Scripture. Scripture. Philippians 1, verse 3 and 4. I thank God in all my remembrance of you always, in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Bible commands us to pray for each other. This is what we do when we are gathered in the Mass. When the church is gathered, we have the responsibility to pray for each other, to pray for the whole church, all right, and the world. Because we are mystically united. Now, what is the order? The order is very important. We pray for the church, the world, our government, the sick and suffering, specific needs, then the deceased. And you know it's important. Because I, I'm not here for a political talk. But we really need to pray, no matter how much they frustrate us, our government. Because there's still our government, whether we like the particular people or not. There are some that I have no idea how they got into the office that they are. <laughs> but I'll give you an example, though. I was at a mission not long ago, and I, I made the comment in one of my talks that I do a mass every month for President Trump. And he was very angry, this man. And he came to me afterwards, he said, Father... This man is so bad. And he rattled off all these things. And I said, listen, I'm not here to open up a political discussion. But what I can tell you is this. Every month now, around the world, forces of evil, led by the Wiccans, or actually witches, are gathering together and placing curses on the president. Now, regardless of what you think of the president, personally, he's still the president. He is our leader, and he is in charge, and we are the people. We are obligated to pray for our leaders. We are obligated to pray for them. So when I pray a prayer or a mass for President Trump, I can't imagine anybody wishing 
an evil curse upon anyone else. Because actually, if that happens, we're the ones who are going to suffer. So why would we do this? We must pray. We must pray for each other. We must pray for our leaders. This is not a bad thing. We must leave our feelings to the side and pray for what is right. And our prayers can make a difference. They're making a huge difference. Look at the pro-life movement today. It's picking up momentum like we've, we've, yeah, like we've never seen. All right. Let's just start the next section real quickly. We just did Liturgy of the Word. What's the next section of the Mass? Liturgy of the Eucharist. All right. Now we are building. We are building up. We can realize that now we are entering into the highest point of our lives, and that is whenever we attend Mass, working towards consecration and receiving of Holy Communion. All right. Now, the liturgy of the Eucharist, the first thing that begins is the offertory. You've heard that term. And this is where gifts are brought to the altar. Why? Oh, the church is just asking for money. Right? No. All right. Matthew 5, 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. This is what the Bible tells us to do. Now gifts on behalf of the people given to the priest are then given back to the people by the priest after they've been transformed. So you're giving a simple gift, a natural gift. The priest is transforming it and giving back to you a supernatural gift. This is amazing. Now, we do also give tithes, right? Are Catholics required to tithe 10%? No. But we are required to pray or fast and alms give. So in a way, the tithe is a requirement, but how much the church is never established. But we are required to give back. Now, this is important. We give tithes because God supplies all of us everything we have and only asks for a portion of it back. So this is understandable. It's not about the church being greedy. It's about God being generous. And you're just giving a little back to him so that through the church, his work can be done. All right. There's two purposes for the preparation of gifts. Now we're talking about the part of the Mass, remember, where the collection is made and then the gifts are processed forward. All right. There are two purposes. The bread and the wine is to be offered and sacrificed to God and to prepare the priest and the people to sacrifice a self-offering of their own lives. This is incredibly important. So hear this again. The preparation of the gifts has two purposes. The bread and wine are to be offered and sacrificed to God and to prepare the priest and the people for their offering to God. So you were offering the bread and the wine to God the Father that will become the body and blood of His Son, and we're offering the priest and the people to God for our offering. So it's both. This is the time to attach the things in your heart to that patent that's coming or that vessel that's coming forward. Like the gifts, God will transform those things you give him. We're giving him bread and wine. He's about to transform those, transubstantiation. But bring him yourself. He can't transform you if you don't bring yourself just like the bread and the wine. Can I transform bread and wine if it's not brought to me? No. God can't transform you if you don't bring yourself to him in the same way the bread and the wine is brought to him. This is what's going on. Are you preparing yourself to be transformed? Or are you smacking on your gum waiting to see if the cowboy game has started yet? Okay. This is important. Now, even the angels bring their vessels forward. They even come forward. 
and they kneel around the altar and they're holding vessels. What's in those vessels? We'll tell you when we get to consecration. All right. The procession of the gifts goes back to when people would bring bread and wine from their own homes. Now, when they are brought forward, the altar is prepared. All right. So, the priest starts by preparation of the altar. There's a deacon. The deacon will do it, or sometimes there is somebody serving, like a server at the altar. Now, it will come. It's a chalice looking like this with the priest. Now, you don't pay attention often. But the top is what we call a corporal. The corporal is opened up, spread out, unfolded on the altar. What's the purpose of the corporal? To capture any particles of the host that may fall so that at the end, at the end of Mass, they're folded back up. And these particles are not fallen to the ground. All right? The next thing. The pall, we'll talk about this in a minute, is set aside. And then the priest begins with the paten. This here is what holds the main host for the celebration of the Eucharist. And the priest holds the paten and he says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness, we know this prayer, right? And what do you say? Blessed be God forever. Now, these words are the exact words Jesus would have spoken at the Last Supper. They are referred to as a Jewish meal prayer in biblical times. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness, right? We have this bread to offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Okay? This is what Jesus would have said. This is a Jewish Eucharistic meal prayer during the time of the Bible. How powerful that we're saying these same words. Now, after this, the priest takes the cruets, a cruet of wine and a cruet of water. He puts the wine into the chalice and then he drops a single drop of water. Now, the drop of water into the wine symbolizes what? Christ's humanity, the drop of water, mixed into the cup of his divinity, the wine. So the two are put together, Christ's humanity and his divinity. Then the priest says quietly, you don't hear this, but by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. So this is what we are doing in the Mass. Now, once you put the water into the wine, it is impossible to ever take it out again. So, this is Jesus in his humanity, can never be separated from his divinity. The mixing of the two symbolizes the unity of the church, the water, and Jesus, the wine. Very important. Now, the priest blesses the wine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through, you goodness, through your goodness we have this wine to offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Now, he places it down, and what does he put over it? All right, the paw. What is the purpose of the pall? People think of funerals, right? Where we lay the pall over the casket. Now we're laying the pall over Christ who's to give his life, right? But do you know the real purpose of the pall? Keep the bugs out. <laughs> it actually is. It's to keep the bugs out. Now I never used to pay attention to this. And I never really used a Paul. Many priests don't use Paul. The Mass is not invalid or illicit if you don't use a Paul. But then I was in Minnesota. <laughs> and I was with a wonderful priest friend of mine up there. And we were celebrating Mass. I was the main celebrant. And the priest was behind me. 
and I poured the precious, or the wine, it's not the precious blood yet, and we had blessed it, and I didn't have a pall. And so after we did the Eucharistic prayers, we finished consecrating the wine. Now it is the precious blood of Christ, right? And sure enough, on the prairies of Minnesota, <laughs> in flew the giant, biggest horsefly <laughs> you've ever seen. And he's circling around over the altar. I have no Paul. And I'm blessing, I'm consecrated, now we're saying the Eucharistic prayer, so my hands are up here, I'm trying to go like this as I'm saying, <laughs> saying the prayer. And sure enough, here comes that horse fly, right into the precious blood. Now, are we priests allowed to remove that horse fly? I see the horse fly. It is time to consume the precious blood. And I look at Father, and I said, Father, it's your parish. <laughs> and Father looks at me and he says, you're the main celebrant. <laughs> and down it went. <laughs> we... <laughs> I now use a Paul at every single Mass. <laughs> I never leave home without it. I even travel. I even travel with my Paul. All right. So, after blessing the cup, and I said we said the prayer, now the priest turns around after he finishes... He bows down and he says his prayer, right? With humble spirit and contrite heart, we may, may we be accepted by you, O Lord. And may our sacrifice, not mine, our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Now the priest is uniting you with this sacrifice that's about to happen. Then the priest turns around and does what? What does he do next? Washes his hands. Now this is important. What this is is symbolic. If that priest has any sin on his soul, maybe he didn't have a chance to go to confession. He should. He really, really needs to. Some of the saints tell that a priest celebrating Mass in a state of grave sin opens himself up for possession. This is what some of the saints tell us. And so it's very important. Now, if a priest doesn't have a chance, that washing of the hands is very important. Because no matter what that priest has done, his sins are suspended. All of his sins are suspended so that he can actually confect the Eucharist. Now, does that mean he doesn't have to go to confession? No. As soon as Mass is over, he's got to go to confession. But the washing of the hands suspend those sins so that the priest is able to confect the Eucharist so you know your Mass is valid even if the priest is a sinner. And then remember, the church, remember the church is made up of the human and the divine. Okay? Like Jesus, the church is human and divine. In the church's divine nature, she will never fail you. The church has never failed ever, ever mistaught you officially. Now you've had some wacky priests and bishops. All right? We've had some of those. But they are not in line with the teaching of the church. The teaching of the church has always remained the truth. It is guided by the Holy Spirit. You will never, ever be misled by the real teaching of the church. Again, be careful to not be led astray by some of these wacky priests or bishops. All right? Sometimes people probably say, I'm a wacky priest. I can be wacky, but I always teach the truth. Okay? That is one thing that the priest must do. However, just like Jesus, the priest is human and it is divine. 
In her divine nature, she is perfect. She will never, this Mass is perfect. Your prayers, as much as you like to say, Father, I pray in my own home, I don't need to go to a church. Your prayers are imperfect. Your prayers are imperfect because you have sin. I have sin. My prayers, your prayers are imperfect. There's only one form of perfect prayer. That is this Mass. What's about to happen in this Mass? Is this Mass is God offering God to God. And that is perfect. What is going on in this Mass, which I'm going to get to in about 10 minutes, is something that we have no idea why or how powerful it is. And I'm going to explain that when we get to the consecration here in a few minutes. But back to this point. The point is, in her divine nature, the church won't fail. But in, in her human nature, she will. We are broken. The church is made up of broken people. But you don't judge the church by the men of the church. Judge the church by the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ.